yeah, I'm, no, I'll cry a little bit, but, you know, it, it'll be all right. Talk loud. I don't generally have a problem with that. <laughs> well, I think I mentioned earlier, I don't remember who I was saying it to, that this is my first Sabbath that's like a summer without school in session. Because when we first got here in August, school had started or was starting right away. And one of the things I've been wondering about is, you know, what summers are like here. And I've been told by certain people, you know, about almost every church summers, things quiet down a little bit. But being that we have a significant part of our campus that is attached to the school, I figured it's even more quiet here than what I would generally anticipate. So obviously we don't have the dorm kids and even a lot of the staff, you know, um, I think the Cortads go up to uh, Yava Pines here. Um, Matter of fact, give me one second if you don't mind. Oh, are you already recording me and everything? Okay. Oh, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I did. I'm sorry. It's probably a Ponzi thing. So. When do you, do you guys go up to Yavin Pines? Hmm? When, when do you go? Of June. And then you're back the next weekend? August. <laughs> okay, so you're pretty much up there most of the summer. I'll uh, I'll see if I can allow that. I'll let you know. <laughs> Good. He's being serious. <laughs> so, anyways, yeah. Um, I'm guessing attendance is maybe half what you would normally see. Well, that's fine. That's what it is, right? It is what it is. And I just, I wonder, you know, with the heat and all, if a few people just, you know, take it easy, don't make it to church every week, even though we have a perfectly comfortable air-conditioned church. It's just, it's natural. Well, I realize it's just the two of us. Should we go ahead and have a nice little discussion? Let's have a word of prayer. God, we just lift you up and praise you today. We thank you for the beauty of this day, for the newness uh, of the day, for the Sabbath, Lord, the reminder of the rest that we have in you, that you have done all the work necessary for our salvation. And we acknowledge and remember that on the Sabbath day. Um, We do lift up Jennifer and just pray that you would bless her as she's getting this, this treatment and that her energy would return, that it would be a success and that she'd be able to move on and enjoy life. Um, Thank you so much for her family and the support that she has. Bless the services today. Bless our discussion. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, we now have two people. Look, let's pray again. Maybe they'll go to four. Um, Well, uh, we're continuing on. We have another uh, month in our, our quarterly and all on the promise. And you see the title, The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant. And when you think about our lesson for today, that's an interesting title and an interesting reality considering the fact that we know the Bible teaches that there was an old covenant and there's a new covenant. And it brings up the question, what was wrong with the old covenant? Or what makes the new covenant better? Uh, is, Is there an everlasting covenant. If there is an everlasting covenant, then why did there need to be a new covenant? You know, and this is actually one of the more perplexing questions that Christians throughout generations have struggled with. What does it mean to be in the new covenant? And different groups have come up with all kinds of answers to that question. The more popular one today that's in most of Christianity, both Catholic and Protestant, is the idea of dispensationalism. The idea that God has worked through people in different eras, affecting salvation in different ways, as best as people could understand it. That would be something that we would struggle with in our denomination because it draws uh, interesting ideas about the character of God that we're not very comfortable with. The idea that God would save people differently. There's a, 
uh, you know, there's the dispensation of law, dispensation of obedience, the dispensa dispensation of ignorance. Um, now, obviously, God does work through those things, but to think, it'd be like, uh, I guess the struggle I would have is like in the, in the justice system, which is a very similar thing. Of, I mean, God's trying to save us. There's been a crime, right? That's sin. There's been uh, a devastating reality because of sin, and we need to come to a solution to that. If the justice system said, well, in this case, even though the crime is the same, in this case, you've got to go to jail. But in this case, you just have to pay a fine. And in this case, there's no penalty whatsoever. I think we would all scratch our heads and say, that doesn't seem very just. That doesn't seem very reasonable. And so that, hi there, good to see you. you were you here last week? Yes. Just a second. My sister is, was here with my sister. Oh, I was going to try to remember. It's not, no. No. I have. I thought I could get it, but I can't remember your name. Uh, I'm Diane. Diane. Very good. Glad to have you, Diane. So that would be kind of our challenge with why we don't agree with the idea that the old covenant was a different system of justice. It was a different system of salvation. It just it, it, it doesn't seem consistent with God, the God who does not change. You know, um, Jesus, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If He's the same then why a new covenant? So that's kind of the question before us today, and we'll look at some different elements of that. Let's read the language of the new co covenant together to begin with. Um, you can go back to the book of Jeremiah if you have your Bibles. Jeremiah 31, 31. It's kind of easy to remember that one because it's same chapter and same verse. Jeremiah 31, 31 where it begins. And, and I'm going to read the, the uh, memory verses, I think, just just verse 31, I think, yeah. But I would like us to read um, a little bit more of the language of the New Covenant here in the book of Jeremiah. If, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read it this morning. Uh, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Now just listen to the language there for a second as how God defines this covenant relationship. He says, they broke it although I was a husband to them. So what do you think right there he's trying to indicate? What is him bringing up the husband-wife relationship speak about how God interpreted what that covenant was? It's like a marriage. He compared his relationship with his people as a husband would relate to his wife. So if they broke it, what does a spouse do that illustrates breaking that relationship? What's the worst thing a spouse can do when they break their... It's okay. They, they, okay, this is, this is the indication of an affair. Okay. This is, this is what God, this is how they broke. I mean, and even when you think about God's uh, 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 paradigm of marriage, marriage, the only way in which God essentially says a, that a marriage can be dissolved is if one of the spouses has been unfaithful. Okay, that's, you know, one of the narrow ways that God says that. that that's my ideal. Now, if there's been other breaks, they lied to you, uh, they didn't take out the garbage on time. Okay, those are, those are unfortunate things, but you need to work through those. But if there's been an absolute failure uh, of such an intimate level of an affair, uh, that symbolizes a brokenness that sometimes and oftentimes healing is, is un, unable to be resolved. So that's the language that I want you to understand as God defines the old covenant. He says, I was a husband to them. I had a relationship, a covenant relationship so deep with them and they broke it. And again, I don't think he means that they just, you know, were lazy or they, you know, as we struggle in our own human relationships, they broke it through that specific thing of going after other gods. Okay, they had an affair, a spiritual affair. They rejected their uh, relationship with God and said, we're no longer... And remember, this is Jeremiah talking. We're not back in the days of the kings or not, uh, or of the, uh, you know, early kings or of the prophets. This is late in the history of Israel, okay? Uh, Israel has already been taken into captivity by the time of, I mean, the 10 northern tribes, right? Assyria had come in and wiped out the 10 tribes of the north. They're not even there anymore because of their idolatry, because of their affair, right? 
And now Babylon has now come and threatened, and, and depending on the timing, they've already conquered Judah. Many people have already taken into captivity. So Jeremiah is speaking late in the history of Israel, saying this is why we're in this situation, because we forgot about our relationship with God. But God hasn't forgot about us. He has a new covenant. I started talking here, and I wasn't even done reading. Um, although I was a husband in verse 33, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God, they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So this is how he describes it. I'm going to make a new covenant. And it's going, to be, it's going to be different, okay? I'm going to write my law, so it's still a covenant based on a, an expectation, based on a, a, a relationship of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of obedience and, and following uh, the expectations of God. But instead of the law being written on stone in an external sense that's, that's guarded in a sanctuary that's in an ark, by the way, by this time, the ark is also gone. Well... Was the ark gone? We don't know at what point the ark disappeared. We know it disappeared in the days of Jeremiah. You know, where it happened after that, you know, I guess Indiana Jones found it, and it's in a government warehouse now. That's, that's what I understand. Okay. But um, so even the symbolism of the stony law is become muddled or lost at this point. And God is saying, but that's okay. Okay. Because I'm going to have a new covenant where you're not going to have to come to a written stony law that's behind a veil, okay, I'm going to give that same beauty and power and ideals, and I'm going to give it to you in your heart, okay? And they won't have to teach again, and I'm going to forgive their iniquity and their sin, I'll remember no more. Now, well, let's come to Hebrews chapter 8 for a moment, and, and then we'll talk a little bit more about this transition from the old covenant to the new covenant. So Hebrews will mention and specifically deal with this transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant in about three chapters. Really, the whole book is kind of the transition from the Old Testament and understanding how Jesus fulfills so much. But in particularly, the Old and New Covenants are going to be dealt with in chapters 8, 9, and 10. But here in Hebrews chapter 8, um, uh, the New Covenant that we just read is going to be repeated, but it begins this way in verse 7. Now listen to this. For if that first covenant, or even go back to verse 6 for a second. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant. That's an interesting term too. Why didn't God give Israel the better covenant? <laughs> what was wrong? It suggests an inadequacy, right? Right? It suggests that although that covenant came from God and it was supposed to be pure and beautiful and wonderful, it wasn't as excellent as it could be, which is an inter interesting thought. And we could, we could uh, parlay out more what that means, better covenant, which he has enacted on better promises. But notice this, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second. But now look at verse 8. For finding fault with them, he says. So where did the fault lie? With the covenant? With God? Who's the them? It's the people. Okay. Was it God who broke the covenant? Was it that it was a bad covenant? No. It was a covenant that the children of Israel rejected. Now, there's, there's a couple things I want to say about this. And believe me, this is a big topic. I've read commentaries and books all dedicated to the Old Covenant, New Covenant, and all this. I don't think there's universal agreement, even in Adventism, in precisely the, the delineation of the difference between the Old and New Covenant. There's kind of different extremes, you might say, different paradigms that are looked at. And I think each of them, while we can learn from them, I don't think any of them completely capture the imagery or the ideals. One of them... Um, goes like this. And actually, if you did your lesson, the very first illustration on page 80 actually kind of illustrates one of those ways in which people sometimes categorize 
the transition from the Old or New Covenant. Did you read that little il illustration? Um, I'll read it. It's only about a paragraph long. A cartoon in a magazine years ago showed a business executive in an office standing before the executives. He was holding a box of detergent in his hands, showing it to the other men and women. He proudly pointed to the word new that was displayed on the large red, on the large red letters on the box, the implication being, of course, that the product was new. The executive then said, it's the new on the box that's new. In other words, all that changed, all that was new, was simply the word new on the box. Everything else was, was the same. In a sense, one could say that the new covenant is like that. Okay? So that's one. Now, I like Gerhard Hausel, the uh, uh, contributor to this. He was a great theologian. I struggle with that personally. Is that really the only thing that's new in the new covenant? It's the same covenant. It just is new. If that's true, don't these words that we just read from Hebrews ring a little hollow then? How can the new covenant be better if it's the same covenant? It just happens to be, uh, you know, reestablished in a new arrangement. How can it say later on, it'll say verse 13, uh, of Hebrews 8, if you're there, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. And whatever is obsolete is growing old and ready to disappear. So I understand what he's saying, and I do believe there's some truth to that. As I said, the new covenant is the same law as the old covenant. It's just in a new location. Instead of being on stony tablets that you have to come before and, 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 and only priests can minister before the veil and there's all these barriers and limitations, now all of a sudden it's internalized in the heart. So we can always come before the throne of God without needing the mediation of the sanctuary services and the priest. Jesus is our mediator, which is what the book of Hebrews is largely about. So, yes, it's true that there are certain elements that are the same. It's still a covenant relationship. God still looks upon his people in a, it's not just a business agreement where we shake hands. and Hey, let's all make money together. And if we all do our part, we're all going to be successful. Okay, that's a very hollow way of looking. This is like a, a marriage. It's much more intimate than a business relationship or a friendship. God still looks upon his church as his bride. So those things are the same. The old covenant and new covenant, that's the same thing. It's still a, an intimate relationship with his people. It's still based on the same principles. It's still ba based on the same character of God. His character hasn't changed, which is why we also reject dispensationalism. Because dispensationalism suggests that the character of God has changed over time because humanity's been so stupid and sinful. Okay? Um, so there's an element to that that, uh, that I say, yes, it's true. The box, everything in the box is the same. It just has the word new on it. Yes, but I think there's more to it than that. The other side of the uh, equation, it's, it's kind of similar to the uh, dispensationalism, but I've heard Adventists, even Adventists I really enjoy. Now, this is Gerhard Hazel who is a great theologian, a great thinker. We benefit even to this day from much of his uh, uh, writing. And he died in the 80s, I think it was, in a car accident. Um, but uh, the other side of it, and this is one I, I'll just share with you. I heard D Doug Batchelor say, um, that, and I respect Doug Batchelor. I think he's given a lot to the church, and we have a lot to benefit from, from the Ministry of Amazing Facts and, and, and Doug Batchelor's leadership. But um, he, de he described the Old Covenant, New Covenant transition in this way. Um, that when God gave the Old Covenant, um, Moses gives the covenant. Um, they're in Exodus chapter uh, 19. And uh, uh, he's, the, 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 he's on the mountain and there's thunder and there's lightning and there's all this. And remember what Israel said when they heard the words of the covenant? They said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. Okay? It was a covenant based upon... Uh, Israel trying to uh, 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 keep their promises on their own, okay? And the fault was, the reality was, they could not do that. And that's why here in Hebrews chapter 8, it says, for finding fault with them. So his way of describing it was that the old covenant was based upon humanity trying to keep the precepts of God on their own. But the new covenant is the same expectation, but now we have the Holy Spirit, and now we have the reality of Christ, and now we're depending on the Spirit. And I get what he's saying. There's some truth to that, too. 
But I also struggle with the idea that God ever established a methodology of relationship that depended upon us singly uh, uh, maintaining uh, without divine intervention our expectations with God. Again, that suggests kind of, and, and I've heard it described, and I think even Doug Batchelor described it as, this was God's way of showing that we cannot save ourselves outside of, of the grace of God coming in and intervening on our part. So God illustrated that we cannot maintain our end of the bargain on our own in the old covenant. And why the new covenant is better is that Jesus comes along and he says, look, I'll do it for you. I've got it. I've died for your sins. I've lived the perfect life. I've, I've, I've succeeded where Adam had failed. And if you trust in me, my righteousness will cover you. And that's the new covenant. Now, again, there's some things to like about that, but I still struggle with the idea that God ever established a methodology where he says, look, if you just come up to me, uh, we're going to be together forever. Just come on up. Come on. You can do it. And humanity struggles and struggles and struggles. Oh, can't do it. Okay, okay, I guess I'll send my son, and he'll do it, and then everything will be fine. I, I struggle with that, too. I struggle with that, too. So, um, I think it's a, a little more simpler than that. Um, I think, well, let me stop right there. I've done a lot of talking, and I know you guys are just anxious to jump in here and just share your wonderful thoughts, too. What do you guys think about this idea of what the new covenant is and how it's an improvement on the old and what was the old then and what is the new. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Well, this is an interesting question, Craig, if you didn't hear him. He said, wouldn't the new uh, covenant have the benefit of the Holy Spirit? Is that, is that, did I say that right? Yeah. So don't, don't, we have a, don't we have an advantage today? It's a good question, valid question, um, that the Israelites did not have. Um, and that's an interesting question. It brings up some other thoughts that I've had about this. Um, well, first, we do know that the Holy Spirit was active in the Old Testament. Daniel was filled with an excellent spirit. The spirit of God hovered over the waters at creation. Um, the prophets were filled with the spirit. Um, so um, the, the scriptures were written through the inspiration of the spirit. So uh, maybe we could say, is the spirit working in a new way since the cross and since creation? Well, that, that might be another way of looking at it. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is, so the new covenant says, uh, God says, I will write my law on your hearts, Right? So were they not supposed to have the law in their hearts in the Old Covenant? You know what I'm saying? Don't you, doesn't it make you wonder? It makes me think that um, they're supposed to be that which was false. They didn't have it. Ah. And so since they didn't have it, um, they, they could get it. So uh, that's why he set it up. Because they didn't have it in their hearts. Right. Right. Yeah, I like that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so I agree with that completely. And even when you think about the law of the Old Covenant, as Gina said, was based on external manifestations of the plan of salvation. All right, Righteousness by faith was visibly seen through the sanctuary services. Even the laws that Gina was talking about, it was all, all those laws were to be educational, um, how they wore their tassels. Okay, and, and, and these are, to me, these are fascinating to study and learn and, 
and, and things like that. But th the tassels were to be a symbol of always stepping within the law of God because tassels could only be one color. Do you remember what color they were? Blue. They could only be blue. All right. And what was the Ten Commandments written on? Sapphire. Okay, the stones that they were written on were blue. So blue has always been the color of legal, of the law. Okay, so they wore blue tassels. Even in the sanctuary service, the coverings that they put, they put blue coverings over some things, they put red coverings over some things, they put purple coverings. Okay, these all had meaning. Okay, so they wore the tassels so, so that they say, I'm always going to walk I will never step outside of God's law. His law guides me. It's my, it's, it's my understanding of, of his purpose. So all of these things had meaning. Okay, every lamb, every dove, every grain offering that was brought what, had meaning about God's provision, about his sacrifice, his love, the cost of our sins, the wages of sin. It was all external. Even circumcision was an external manifestation of God's plan of saying, look, uh, if you're going to do this, you've got to live differently than how the rest of the world lives. But in the Old Testament, even Moses said, I've all, speaking on behalf of the Lord, God says, I've always been more interested in the circumcision of the heart than in the circumcision of the flesh. So I think what Diane said is very true. They got caught up in those external things, thinking those things now made them righteous. I got my tassels. I've been circumcised. I gave my lamb. Ha, 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 God. You've got to accept me whether you like it or not. And they lost the heart. They lost the heart. They lost that those things were symbols of the relationship they were to have with God. And so God does much more. Say, look, in this new covenant, I'm reducing or even eliminating much of, much of these external things because you guys got lost in them. And you now need to make sure they're in your heart. Now, not all external things were eliminated. Um, which brings me to this uh, very interesting phrase in the new covenant I don't know if you've ever thought about it much. Um, it's right at the beginning. Behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant. Isn't that interesting? The days are coming. What days? What was God waiting for? Why didn't he give them the new covenant right then and there? Say, okay, Jeremiah, they're all in captivity. Everything's a mess. Today, let's do it. I'm going to rate. You're going to become like Moses. You're going to lead people out. You're going to have this new covenant. He doesn't do that. He says, in the future, I have a plan in place that's going to restore our covenant relationship. What days is he talking about? Yeah, I don't mean to make this tricky. <laughs> uh, isn't he talking about the days when the Messiah would come? So when you think of that context, Jesus did something fundamental in our covenant relationship with God. Jesus fulfilled those external symbols, that shadow. Uh, Paul talks about that, that uh, the, the law, the ritual laws were the shadow and Christ is the substance. Okay? He's what casts the shadow. And now that the substance is here, the shadow you know, isn't what we need to focus on. Okay? So Christ is now that manifestation of understanding our covenant relationship with God because of his life and work on our behalf. So let's talk about how Jesus fulfilled the necessary elements of what the old, uh, old covenant uh, manifestations were so that now in a new covenant relationship, we don't have to worry about those things. And that really is it. All of those sacrifices were, and Hebrews goes to a, 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 a large point to point this out. The, the blood of sheep and goats could never save anybody, right? It, it doesn't make any sense at all. Those were never intended to be the ultimate expressions of the uh, redemption that God had in store. I mean, that would just be uh, uh, in, in, in unthinkable, okay? It always was meant to be a reminder that one day a better sacrifice would take the place of our, uh, of our penalty. The most, okay. the most perfect sacrifice. You didn't bring their very best. That's right. If you didn't bring your very best, then it was kind of null and void. Right. Um, so Jesus was the perfect, ultimate sacrifice. And even when they brought their very best, 
So you have a perfect lamb. I mean perfect, not a blemish on it, not limp, not weakly, not a run, strong, vibrant lamb that is just robust and is perfect and wonderful, right? It's still not good enough, right? You know, he, uh, Isaiah says that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags, right? Even the best that we can offer is tainted by sin, which, by the way, was a problem when Uzzah put his hand on the ark, right? The reason why he was struck down had nothing to do with his, you know, well, I'm going to stable the ark here, is it was his thinking that if I put my sinful hand on the ark, it's better than it touching the dirt of the road. But what he failed to understand is our hand is more filthy because of sin and it should never come in contact with the whole of course there's the whole story of of the ark there and how they weren't following the will of god it's it's more complicated than that but it wasn't just that you know he missed he misunderstood he thought i'm going to protect it from getting dirty right that's what he thought he was doing but by him touching it he brought the unrighteousness of sin in contact with that ark Right? It would have been better for the ark to fall down in the mud because that mud is cleaner than our righteousness. Does that make sense? So, um, uh, so yes, Jesus was that sacrifice. So the old covenant was you need to bring your inadequate sacrifices to illustrate your understanding of the greater sacrifice that has come, that is to come. That's what the old covenant was. The new covenant is don't bring those inadequate sacrifices anymore because the perfect sacrifice has already been accomplished. Right? Does that make sense? So it's, in a sense, then it is the same covenant. It's just in a different context. We are now looking back. The, the new covenant looks back upon the perfection of Christ and says now we're entering into a relationship with God, seeing what God has done on our behalf where the old covenant was looking forward to something that had not happened yet. Any other thoughts about kind of how these two covenants, um, how Jesus was the fulfillment of the, uh, the, sh the, the substance shadow thing, the type anti-type? Uh, the blood of Jesus. Absolutely. And the other thing I would say too, both covenants were based on faith. And this is important. This is why I struggle with the, the idea that the old covenant was all that the Lord has said we will do as though it was more of a covenant of works. Now they were called to be accountable. I'm not saying they shouldn't have said that. I'm not saying that was a bad sentiment. But um, it was still, even in their works, it was to be an act of faith. I'm bringing my turtle doves, okay, knowing that these turtle doves are insufficient for my sins, but trusting in God's promise that one day the greater sacrifice will come. It was still an act of faith. And today it's still an act of faith. I look back now. Again, those turtle doves and lambs and goats were to look forward by faith. I'm looking back in faith and saying the sacrifice of Christ happened and is the all-sufficient uh, uh, covering of my sins. Both of them are a covenant of faith. So no dispensationalism here. There was not a previous plan where God says, oh, you can be saved by works here, and you can be saved by the law here, and you can be saved by ignorance here. I forget. I, there's seven or eight dispensations. I get them confused. Um, it's been a while since I've studied dispensationalism, but um, there's all these. There was the Noadic dispensation, and then there was the Abrahamic, and da 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 Very, very ornate, very, very uh, uh, complex. So both of them were, uh, I, again, God is the same. He does not change. I am the Lord. I change not. Okay? Let's keep that in mind. This is where we would, you know, differ with those who want to say, no, God changed. He did things different there and he did things different there. Uh, I think that, 
creates problems um, for our understanding of God. Um, this is from Hans Lorndell, um, who uh, is a, was, has he passed away now? I think he's still alive. Um, a theologian. The new covenant functions better than the old covenant for God's people. In contrast with Israel's old covenant, Christ affects three basic promises of God. One, he internalizes God's moral law in the hearts of his people. Now, again, I, I agree with what Diane said a while back. I think it was always intended to be internal. I don't think God ever intended that everything in our relationship would just be external. Okay? But I think they, the fault was with the people who got so wrapped up in the external, they missed the internal. So God in the new covenant is much more specific. He says, yes, those stony laws are still important, but it's not the stone. Okay? It's the understanding of what that represents. That needs to be in your heart. Okay? He internalizes God's moral law in the hearts of his people. Two, he individualizes the saving knowledge of God so that each Israelite, without exception, has a personal, immediate relationship with God. Now, I want to talk about that for a second. Uh, so, in, in theory, the Old Covenant was a, um, a communal covenant. Okay? In other words, it wasn't designed specifically for the individual. If you were a Jew, if you were an Israelite, you were part of the covenant. It really didn't have anything to do with, you know, you uh, coming to an age of accountability and making a personal decision. Well, I've been raised in the church, and now that I'm 15, I think, yeah, well, yeah, I guess I'll join it, okay? And by the way, most ancient religions, most religions even today, if you're born in it, you are it, you know? That's just the way it goes, and it's considered weird and wild when someone, you know, doesn't embrace it, or even, uh, even worse, you can be excommunicated or shunned or whatever. Um, so in a way, it was very consistent when God made the Old Covenant. He even says, I'm making it with the house of Israel, right, and the house of Judah. I'm making this a communal covenant. It's for, it's for the people, okay? Now, that doesn't, again, that doesn't mean that God didn't, God didn't care about the individual, but he just expressed it more in a communal way. And this is where you see, and, and by the way, the communal idea of a society is something very important for us to remember even when we study the Bible. When one person in the community sinned, the entire community suffered, you know, okay? Remember when David took the census of the people when he, and he wasn't supposed to, it was an act of, of disloyalty to God when he did it. It was his distrust of God. God, I don't know if you can help me. I'm going to have to count up my army because I don't think you're strong enough to help me. I need to know how many people I have to fight for me because God, I don't think you can do it. So let's count up the people. That's kind of the idea of what David's sin there was. Do you remember what happened because of his sin? A plague broke out. A plague broke out and thousands of people died. And you think, that's not very fair. They didn't do anything. But in this communal mindset, an individual sin affected the community. Um, during the days of Joshua, when they were entering the promised land, remember they had to conquer all these little cities? They went to conquer Ai, just the city Ai. Okay, did it work? No, do you remember why? Because when they conquered Jericho, God had said, don't take anything. None of it belongs to you. I want all of it destroyed. But someone took from Jericho. I forget his name. What was his name? I remember Joshua says, give glory to God. Speak to remember they, they, they cast lots to find out who it was? Uh, da, 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 da. Someone, Achan, son of Achan. Remember that? So when they went to attack Ai, several of their soldiers died. Okay? They died. And Joshua and the people, they're like, what is going on? We thought God was on our side. We just defeated it. Jericho, that had great big walls. We marched around it. The walls fell down. But because of one person's sin, the sin of Achan, the entire community suffered. So this idea of communal responsibility, communal existence, was completely interwoven within the society of Israel. Okay? The idea that no man is an island, John Doan, the great poet, no man is an island. Okay, no matter what you do, you send ripple effects. And now we may have a, a greater sense of individuality today, but in a sense, that's still pretty true. Okay, our actions impact others. What have we just gone through this other year with coronavirus? Right? Our actions can be held accountable to others. So you need to take the proper precautions, and if you don't, you may be affecting others. Okay, so in the new covenant, God expresses a higher level 
of individual relationship. Again, I hesitate to say that that didn't exist, nor does the communal aspect not exist in the new covenant. But there is a greater emphasis in the reality of the individual relationship. We are part of this. If, if, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, we are part of a great community of, of believers. And some people believe if I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, my name's on the books. I have that communal salvation. God can't keep me out of heaven. I'm going to point to the record book and say, it says right here, you got to let me in. No, some people really, I mean, they might not say that. I might be embellishing a little, but in their thinking and behavior, that's in a lot of Christians, not just Adventists, okay? Um, um, we have to individually have that law written on our hearts and make that individual connection with God. And through that, the community benefits and is blessed, okay? So that, that was number two. Number three, again, this is how the new covenant is an improvement. He forgives the sins of God people, of God's people and will remember their sins no more. Now, did God not do that in the old covenant? This gets us into the weeds just a little bit. How did God forgive sins before Calvary? How could he forgive sins before Calvary? There had been no penalty paid, not sufficient penalty. So in a way, he did not forgive their sins because he couldn't. In a way, in a universal way that satisfies the, the issues of the great controversy, those people died in faith, right? This is what Hebrews chapter 11 is about. All the people who died before Christ died in faith that one day the burden and the payer of sin would come and be successful. Okay? So in a way, they were not forgiven. But of course, in the heart of God, he knew that Jesus, you know, God is not bound by time and space and, and all these things. God knew that Jesus would one day come and be successful. So in an individual relationship, God says, oh yeah, Abraham, David, okay, uh, all, all you people, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. I, I forgive you. You, you, you know, because of your, your faith in Jesus, but it's a probationary forgiveness, right? It's probationary. Because in an ultimate sense, God cannot satisfy the requirements of his own law unless an adequate sin bearer paid the penalty for their sin. See, this gets us into that. A little bit of things we don't, maybe even a little bit of discomfort we don't like to think about at times. But in reality, that's how it had to be. Um, and in reality, that's also the, the way in which um, uh, many of the parables and even the sanctuary service itself illustrated the probationary relationship that God had with forgiveness. When you brought your sins to the sanctuary, okay, you laid, you brought your lamb, Okay, which was the more common thing, but there were other things you could, you could bring depending on the circumstance. And you confessed your sins. I, I have failed the Lord and I acknowledge my sins. And now this, I'm laying my sins by faith upon this innocent victim. Okay, you were transferring your guilt, spiritually transferring your guilt to that innocent victim. The priest said, okay. And depending on the sacrifice, sometimes you had to slaughter that animal. Okay, or it did not count. And in some sacrifices, the priest slaughtered the animal, which is something I don't think we always remember. There were times that it did not count unless you took that knife across the neck of the animal, which just increases the visceral reality of it. Okay? But then the priest took the blood, okay, which is the life of the animal, that's that guilty blood, and he would sprinkle it before the altar, before the uh, veil, excuse me, before the veil. right? And that symbolized that now the, the guilt and the, and the penalty of that is now contained within the sanctuary. And then once a year, they would have a service called the Day of Atonement, right? The Day of Atonement, which symbolized that period when the sanctuary itself would be cleansed, which is why at that time, the Israelites had to, uh, the Bible says, afflict themselves, and they had, to, they had to, to, to be very humble during this time because the high priest had to go in and cleanse the sanctuary. And when he would come out, he would declare um, that God is faithful and uh, he has cleansed us from sin. Well, what happened to those sins that whole year up until the Day of Atonement? 
They were probationary forgiveness. It was probationary until the perfect sacrifice came. It was an illustration of the plan of salvation that was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So we have to remember that our relationship with God uh, is just one aspect of the issues of the great controversy. Remember, Satan and his angels argued that God is not faithful and God is not love. And if we live by selfishness and by sin, we're going to have a lot more success and happiness. So God can forgive us uh, personally all day long. Craig, I forget you forgive me. Yeah, I forgive you. Okay, wonderful. But there's another element to this world that needs to be satisfied. Okay? So if, if, uh, if, I, if I come to Jennifer and Craig and I steal 100 bucks from each of them, okay, and, I, I, and, and then I say, Craig, I'm sorry, and Craig says, hey, I, I forgive you. Jennifer can still say, what about me? Right? Okay, so there's other parties involved in this that God... Remember, God does not want sin to rise up again ever again. So it's not just about God and, and us getting on the right side. Thank you, God. You're so wonderful. It's just what, you know, you got... God has to, uh, he has to answer the question of sin so that after the great controversy is over and all things have been resolved, every question about God's ability to save has been answered so that no one will ever choose sin again. So that's just an important element to remember as well. Okay, we've about five minutes left. Um, However much ancient Israel, particularly at the time of Christ, lapsed into legalism, the religion given by Yahweh was never legalistic. And we throw, we throw around that word legalistic um, a lot, and, and you hear a lot. Um, legalism means salvation by law. If I keep the law perfectly, then I'll be saved. That's a kind of a quick way of saying it. And... Uh, uh, we need to understand that God has never been a legalist. He never gave us the law or the covenant or, or any of his promises or sanctuary or anything to say, okay, here you go. If you never misstep, if you keep this perfectly, we're going to be in good shape. Okay? The law was always given to be an illustration of the brokenness of our relationship and our need of God. From Eden onward, it was always presented as grace. God's grace offered to those who would accept it and the terms of it. By choosing to accept God's grace and surrender to it, people entered into a covenant relationship with God. What are the advantages of the new covenant over the old? We'll probably have to just have a few comments on that. Hi, D. So what are the advantages of the new covenant? Gina mentioned a while back, you know, there is a, a simplicity about um, our relationship with God that we don't have to wear the tassels, Okay, and we don't have the 632 other ritualistic laws and things like that. So I, I would just maybe point that out in general. But can you think of any other advantages that we have to the new covenant that they did not have in the old covenant? What are some of the advantages to them? What makes it a better covenant? Okay, we didn't even talk much about the priesthood. Yeah, but the entire role of the priesthood was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We no longer have to go to a person and, and, then, and then hope that that person knows what they're doing and then they speak on our behalf for God. We now have Jesus Christ as the perfect mediator. So that's a big improvement right there. Now, there's still a role for confession, confess your sins one to another, but in an ultimate sense, we can go right to God without a human mediator because we have Christ who is both man and God. So he's still the humanity, but what are some of the other advantages of the new covenant? What makes it a better covenant? That's so huge, right? We are looking back on what has already been accomplished, right? And, and yes, the promises of the Old Covenant were powerful. They had to trust that God would not fail, right? Now, if you believe in who God is, that's not, that's not a, a huge jump of faith, but it's still an act of faith that, that God's going to be able to send someone who will not fail, right? Okay. 
we are looking back on a God who has not failed, right? It's already done. I mean, that's a big advantage in the new covenant. We're looking back on it and saying, thank you, God, for being faithful, for keeping your promises. They were looking forward and saying, God, we know that you're faithful to one day keep your promise. We're looking back and saying, thank you, you have kept your promise. You know, that's a huge advantage and prim probably the primary advantage. I mean, there are days that some of the Old Testament rituals, I kind of think we ought to give them a try. There, there, there's some real illustration and there's still, there's some practical realities to them that I think still have some certain benefits. And I, you know, not, not in a moralistic sense, but, um, you know, we say, well, you know, they, they can do what they want or, you know, we can do what we want. We don't have to worry about this, this and that. But uh, again, just as they got caught up in their rituals, sometimes we get caught up in our liberties and realize uh, we still have a covenant relationship with God that needs to be maintained. So um, it's kind of two ditches on the same road. So um, again, it's a fascinating study, uh, uh, worthy of, of greater uh, contemplation. But I think if I could leave you just with this one thought, that God is faithful, God is consistent, God is fair, God is good. And everything that we need to understand about our covenant relationship with God can be found in Jesus Christ in the life and words and work and ministry and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the perfect relationship with, with God is found. He answered the questions of the great controversy. Okay? He brings us, and this is another thing that I, the lesson did talk about that I thought was beautiful. The fact that God wants to make a new covenant with us is powerful because humanity continues to fail and fail and fail and fail and fail and God continually comes back and says my mercies are made new and I'm ready to reestablish as long as you haven't gone you know beyond the point of of acknowledgement I will always be there there was a song I used to uh, listen to uh, uh, by Petra um, uh, one of the uh, lines says you can walk 10,000 steps away but you know it's only one step back, right? That you can, you can turn your back on God, but he is always right there. You can walk away from him, but he was always there to receive you and hear you and enter into that covenant relationship again. So I um, guess that's where we're going to have to draw it to a close this morning. Good to have you at a small group this morning, but it was fun. Thank you for your comments and your participation. Let's have a word of prayer. God in heaven, thank you, Lord, that we can be in your presence. Thank you that you have never given up on us. Thank you that all of your promises were fulfilled in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And we can look back and learn and appreciate and have such great confidence in, in your ability to save and forgive and restore us, Father, because we've seen it accomplished in the past. And Lord, we know that you're coming soon. And we look forward to that day. So Lord, be with us, sanctify us, Keep us faithful because of your power and your spirit until that day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.